25 years ago, I made a series of films about wine that saw me travel the world, building up into a history, which then became a book. Today, I thought I'd revisit it and cut it up into bite-sized chunks for you to view exclusively online. I hope you enjoyed viewing them <laughs> as much as I enjoyed making them. I go back to San Francisco just as often as I can find a good excuse, and they're not hard to find, because no great city is so much part of wine country as San Francisco. A Napa Valley just to the north, wine country all around, and of course, wine-loving inhabitants who do know what they're talking about. Franciscan brothers were the first to bring winemaking to California towards the end of the 18th century. They established a chain of missions up the coast from Mexico as far as Sonoma, just north of San Francisco Bay. Mission winemaking was extremely primitive. It used only one grape, called the Mission. Here at La Purissima, near Santa Barbara, one of the biggest of the settlements, they had relatively sophisticated equipment. Mostly, the Indian converts trod and fermented the grapes in cowhides lassoed between trees. So the Spanish had been colonizing Central and South America for two whole centuries before they even looked at California. When they did, it was a combined religious and political exercise. There were Franciscan brothers and there were Spanish soldiers. The real object of the thing was to establish a claim to the land to prevent the Americans from coming here from the east, or the British from the sea, or even the Russians from coming south from Alaska. You may well ask why the Spanish left California alone for so long. Apparently, they were only really interested in sources of gold. And as far as anybody then knew, there wasn't any gold in California. The whole picture changed in 1849, the year of the gold rush. All interests shifted north, from Los Angeles, where ranchers had at least started improving on the Mission wine, to the Sierra foothills northeast of San Francisco. Sacramento was the capital of this gold country. It still is the capital city of California. The gold miners were getting rich. They were also getting thirsty. And it didn't take long to discover that parts of Northern California were much cooler than Los Angeles and made much better wine. But of course there were people who realized that where there were gold miners who'd found the stuff, there would be a market for wine. And there were two really remarkable entrepreneurs who set about providing them with it. 1849, Count Agaston Harasti arrived in California. He was a Hungarian adventurer leading one of the many wagon trains that lumbered in the 2,000 miles from the Middle West. Within months, he'd become sheriff of the new town of San Diego, then he moved north, looking for a better place to grow wine, until he met General Mariano Vallejo, the last Mexican governor of California, before it became independent. Vallejo was living an idyllic life among his vines and his scandalously numerous children. Here are some of the legitimate ones. On his ranch, which still stands just outside the old mission town of Sonoma. And here on his porch, where the general used to take his evening glass of wine in his favorite rocking chair, looking down over the valley of Sonoma, he's supposed to have met the Hungarian for the first time and given him a bottle of wine. And legend has it that Harasti said, General, this stuff ain't bad. It was the beginning of a famous rivalry and a famous partnership. In fact, within a dozen years, two of Harasti's sons married two of the general's daughters in a double wedding which they celebrated on this very porch. The Sonoma Valley, cooled by ocean breezes, had everything Harasti was looking for. If Vallejo's wine was good, Harasti would make better. He settled on a property he called Buena Vista, planted 400 acres of the dry hills, and soon became famous for a grapevine that was apparently his alone. Its name was Zinfandel. Nobody knew where it had come from in the first place, but its richly red wine 
with a tang of brambles, some people say, perhaps raspberries, has become almost a symbol for all the wines of California. So people tend to think that it's Ferrasti's greatest contribution. Far from it. His really great achievement for California was a journey he made to Europe in 1861, when he brought back no less than 100,000 cuttings of different vine varieties from all over the old world. In fact, he gave California its raw material for success. I can hardly think of anywhere that I'd rather spend time than the Napa Valley or the Sonoma Valley next door. And filming there, never exactly a great hardship. The difficulty is you break for lunch and then do you ever get back to it again afterwards? The Sonoma Valley lies one fold of mountains inland from the Pacific Ocean. Parallel, one fold inland again, lies the Napa Valley, wearing the air of a remote and privileged pastoral realm. Napa is an Indian word for plenty, and from the start, the settlers of Napa thought big. By the 1880s, they were building wineries and excavating cellars on a massive scale. To satisfy the demand for labor, into San Francisco Bay poured thousands of Chinese from across the Pacific. They were making very, very good wine in Northern California in the 19th century. But then came the 20th century nightmare of prohibition when the whole industry collapsed. Rowing back from that, the University of California had to do a lot of work on re-establishing quality. And the first thing it really talked about and thought about was matching the wine grapes to the best climates for them, the cool places where they would ripen slowly and give really good flavors. California's coastal climate has intense local variations. Just watch the Golden Gate on a summer afternoon. The fog is racing in here from the Pacific, racing through under the Golden Gate, building up in height as it comes inland. And of course, the fog is cold air made visible. It's clammy and it cools the whole of the interior of the Bay Area. It reaches up in fingers up all the valleys like the Sonoma Valley and the Napa Valley all around. Anywhere along the coast where the hills drop low enough, the pattern is repeated. Pacific fog refrigerates another valley. The university plotted where each of the best European grapes could ripen under ideal conditions. In fact, it made the grape variety the touchstone of California wine. Not just the university, but individual, even eccentric perfectionists made important contributions. Men like James Zellerbach, who was such a lover of Burgundy that he imported vines, cellar equipment, everything, in a determined effort to get the taste exactly right. He even built a whimsical scale model of the Chateau de Clos de Vougeau on a Sonoma hill. Zellerbach evidently had a real flair for authenticity and detail. In this little cellar of his, I can almost believe that I really am in Burgundy. It's not just the scale that's right, it's even the atmosphere. And in fact, he was the first Californian to put in humidifiers. But most revolutionary at the time was the barrels. And this barrel is actually made in Nuit Saint-Georges in Burgundy. In his passion for getting it right, he'd stumbled on something that even the French didn't know or hadn't really acknowledged. Half or maybe let's say a quarter of the special flavor of Burgundy is simply the tang of the oak grown and sawn into planks in the forests of France. It's meeting the wine growers in places like California that makes you understand just how mad they are about their own land, how keen to find out its qualities, to avoid the possible mistakes, to make the best, best possible wine out of it. There are some wonderful characters. So the Californians studied the climate first, then chose their grapes, then perfected their methods in the cellar. Relatively late in the day, they've come to studying what the French traditionally put first of all, the soil. The best way by far to find out what's going on in the soil under the vines is to dig a hole right in the middle of the vineyard, which is what we've done here, and discovered that the deepest that a root can go here is about two feet below the soil surface. Under that, this clay is so rock hard that it can't go any deeper at all. But when we dug another hole just a couple of hundred yards away, we found no layer of clay at all, 
just rich, loose soil that the roots absolutely love. They can go as deep as they like. And you can see the result in the vines around. And here is a shoot that at vintage time, which it is now, is still growing lustily as though it was midsummer. I wonder if I can tell which wine comes from which vineyard. Well, there's a big clue in the color. Tucker Catlin is one of the top vineyard managers in the Napa Valley. Well, it's certainly pink. My goodness, yes. There's a real deep red in this one. And the... Oh, yes, the smell is according. That's concentrated, really rich wine, dark-colored one. That's exactly right. The experience we've had from this shows that marrying this variety to the rich soil is wrong, but the marriage of Pinot Noir to that stressed soil is perfect. What happens to the deep soil, then? Well, the deep soil, we, since we made this wine, we decided to graft those vines over to Chardonnay. And the Chardonnay from that rich soil is, is really superb. The rich soil has more moisture, gives uh, a better wine in a white wine, but in the red, you need the color and the texture, which comes through with stress. So you need the stress on red wines more than whites.